Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, and friends. This year has marked the midpoint in the school's current five year research cycle, where long planned projects reach fruition and new initiatives and collaborations gain pace. Our program develops established strengths in the Fitch Laboratory at Knossos and in our long standing field projects while exploiting numerous new opportunities. Archaeology remains central. It was gratifying that Heritage Daily Magazine's top 10 archaeological discoveries worldwide in 2013 included the Neolithic settlement of Kutunu Magula with its exceptional collection of figurines. A program of 3D scanning of these figurines, conducted over the past year, has revealed much important new detail of dress, jewellery, and anatomy. But the overall breadth of our research, from international relations to archaeology, and the diverse range of networks linking our UK and international collaborators are among the school's greatest assets. Our distinctive voice as a long-standing historical presence in Greece is a vital element in enabling us to build new relationships as Greece becomes an ex extremely exciting research place. I'll report more fully next year on one such collaboration, a workshop in visual anthropology held just before Christmas, involving colleagues from the School of Social Sciences at the Pandia University. While the news from Greece, which reaches colleagues in Britain, continues to focus on crisis and unrest, it's an important part of our job to publicise the strength and diversity of Greek research in all areas of our activity. As we've been frequently reminded over the past year, rescue excavations for major infrastructure projects are now delivering the volume and quality of data required for large-scale shifts in understanding of whole periods and regions. In collaboration with our colleagues from the French School, We've therefore restyled AG Online to be even more accessible with photograph searches and map searches. This contains a mass of information conveniently synthesized in print in the new format archaeological reports. And we're most grateful to colleagues who supply us with reports of their projects for inclusion. Sometimes research takes on a particular quality by virtue of contemporary resonances. In other cases, contemporary circumstances and future prospects provide excellent material with which to explore ideas of global significance. Our conference in Nicosia on Greece and the Levant in the Age of Empire, in collaboration with the Universities of Cyprus and Athens, at which we debated in Geralia the impact of the great powers on the region through the 19th and early 20th centuries, and the nature and current salience of the concept of the Levant, took place soon after the banking crisis broke in May 2013, when international interest in Cyprus's assets and strategic role was once again a matter of intense speculation. The Balkan Futures Programme with the British Institute in Ankara and the Ecofin Sezdafen, which considers evolving relationships between Greece, Turkey and their Balkan neighbours, this year supported a particularly rich combination of debate on contemporary questions, the first milestone workshop on rethinking Turkey's engagement in the Balkans, hosted by the Ankara-based think tank, Yusak. <coughs> historical reflection on issues of heritage and identity, and a powerful demonstration of the value of Balkan case material in exploring wide-reaching concepts, perceptions of time in the case of a Research Council-funded workshop on Balkan topologies, podcasts of which are on our website. Balkan Futures Fellow, as Gidilina Kirkan, pursued research into the comparative development of Istanbul and Thessaloniki as commercial centres, and has organised the second milestone workshop on the role of the state to be held at the school next month. I look forward to reporting next year on Adriatic Connections, a new British Academy funded collaboration with the British School at Rome, which explores the Adriatic as a contact zone from the 7th to 14th centuries AD, and on our new research fellow, Magdalena Scobler, who works on the cult of the Virgin Mary in the Adriatic. Research in the fine and applied arts featured long planned events drawing on the Byzantine Research Fund archive. In December 2012, we held an exhibition of 19th and early 20th century photographs and drawing of the Byzantine monuments of Thessaloniki at the Bafapulia Cultural Centre in Thessaloniki, with a catalogue co produced with the Centre for Byzantine Research at the Aristotle University. And a portion of this material will shortly travel to Bologna for an exhibition in the Medieval Museum opening in April. And then, in September last, the conference, Byzantium and British Heritage, was hosted by the Centre for Hellenic Studies at King's College London. This was designed
designed to open a dialogue between Byzantinists and 19th century cultural historians, especially experts on the arts and crafts movement. To understand not only the work of the arts and crafts architects on the Byzantine monuments themselves, but how they conceived Byzantium they were documenting, a fascinating moment in the development of the idea of Byzantium in modern scholarship. The same was amply fulfilled by a diverse audience and speaker panel, seen here on a tour of Westminster Cathedral, J.F. Bentley's Neo Byzantine Masterpiece. The school's arts bursary was held by photographer and filmmaker Sophie Michael, a graduate of the Slade School of Fine Art and the Royal Academy Schools. Sophie uses 16mm and Super 8 film and manipulates analog processes by editing blinding in the camera, using superimposition and multiple projections. While in Athens, she based herself on the school museum and created three experimental short films, Lines, Morning, and Attica. The last then developed into a short film combining Iron Age pots and motion to the sound of 1970s light key records. Her successor, Anna Ilsley, a London-based painter who studied at the University of Brighton in the Princess Drawing School, worked on a project linking landscape, myth, and women, and I'll report on her residency next year. Turning now to archaeology, in addition to working in the field, the Fitch Laboratory, and open source, our program featured a conference on sanctuaries and cults in ancient Thessaly, and a new epigraphy seminar with the Epigraphic Museum, the Epic Museum, and the Greek Epigraphic Society. This evening, I can present only highlights. Much more will appear in AG Online and archaeological reports. I begin with Left Hand D, where further work on the so called Megaron in Region 1, now termed Building M, has identified some eight use phases from LH3C middle to early protogeometric. Further evidence of subgeometric and late geometric occupation in the area includes two small Iron Age buildings which reuse materials from earlier structures, and a sub protogeometric or late geometric building, U1, located in the northwest but mostly lost to erosion. During this period, pits were dug in the southwest part of Building M and between Area M and the late geometric complex to the west in Area H. More work was undertaken in the area south of these structures, where high quality protogeometric ceramics were associated with walls and surfaces. In Region 2, examination of the stratigraphical sequences of the so called ritual zone began. A pilot study of the faunal remains used domestic deposits from Region 1 as comparanda against which to assess potential structured ritual deposits. Notable finds included an incomplete sheep skeleton in a pit within structure B, and isolated specimens such as a large portion of naturally shed antler and a butchered lion humus. Study of course and cooking wares from well dated late bronze and early Iron Age contexts used polarite light optical microscopy to verify the range of fabrics identified in hand specimen and examine the use of raw materials and methods of vessel construction. The majority of samples contained quartz and finite inclusions, consistent with the results of previous analysis of Middle Bronze Age fabrics from left hand D. Dislocation, showing different orientations of case structure, not typical of wheel thrown pots, were found in a handmade Iron Age cooking pot and a late Bronze Age coarse body shirt with internal wheel rings. These rills may indicate that wheel made cooking ware at this period was not thrown, but handmade in wheel fashion. Supporting evidence includes the absence of the spiral grill inside the vessel base that typically falls when clay is drawn up during wheel throwing, and a rare example of the vessel wall becoming thicker as it rises. Analysis of preferred fabric orientation revealed quilt traces in largely bronze age coarse tunnels, proved inconclusive for cooking wear, noting that the structures of late bronze and handmade over iron age cooking pots were very similar. Turning to Crete, the focus of two new publications in the BSA Studies series. Our research centre at Knossos has large group projects, the Knossos Urban Landscape and Knossos Neolithic projects, Little Palace North, Southwest Houses, and Mitos Pegos excavations, as well as the work of individual, mostly young scholars. The curatorial project, which preserves and documents the extensive holdings of the Stratigraphic Museum and trains museum studies interns, and, for the first time, postgraduate training course in Greek and Roman pottery. Preparations for the upcoming excavations on Ipsalis Hill are now well advanced. In East Crete, the second field season of Palekastro 
focused on a new area of the settlement. Despite being one of the most extensively explored mineral and settlements, Palaiostro has not yet yielded a court centered building or palace, and the existence or not of such a structure remains a key question. In 2001, a geophysical survey indicated possible buried features of a scale and alignment consistent with a palatial building, and what were thus named the palace fields, the framed area on the slide. Further geophysics in 2012 apparently confirmed the interest of the area. However, the geophysics proved misleading. Excavation in the areas of most promise revealed little but deep, gradual accumulations of pollution. Sporadic finds in these levels are generally mixed in date, though with increasing depth, they become gradually earlier, from late Mineral three through late Mineral one to early Middle Mineral. These deposits were probably created by a gully which carried water down the steep slopes of Petal Fass, plus in flash flood events. It would have been logical to conclude that this gully marked the edge of the settlement. But excavation a little further to the east, away from the town, produced both architecture and finds from the late Mineral three and late Mineral one b periods, immediately beneath the topsoil. The settlement was thus more extensive than previously imagined, though further excavation will be needed to establish whether this area is the eastern edge of the town or a less peripheral area with possible civic buildings. Finds include a group of late Mineral three a 2 to b material that could be interpreted as a shrine, the collapsed upper levels of a late Mineral one b destruction event, and an enigmatic curving feature, which probably dates to the protoclacial period. Moving north into the Cyclades, the final season of intensive survey on chaos covered some of the more remote parts of the island. Intensive collection was carried out at 25 areas of interest or polygons, a total of 26 such polygons now being defined, predominantly in the northwest coastal region, but occurring in most parts of the island, apart from the Far East. These represent areas of potential intensive, diachronic use over 6.4% of the island's surface. Less intensive, including agricultural use, is indicated by wider scatters and the terracing, which was mapped worldwide, islandwide. The earliest evidence for activity on Keros is provided by the ship Stone, 99% of which is newly in obsidian. The earliest artifacts, 14 late Neolithic arrowheads, Many tagged and with parallels from Andiboros, Mykonos, and Andros, were many isolated finds, often from the key hinterland. Since no other finds are so early, Keros was probably not settled during the late Neolithic, but was rather visited for hunting, perhaps by populations from Naxos or Amoros, where contemporary settlements existed at Zazke and Mignola, respectively. The first settlement may date to the final Neolithic. Assemblages with percussion blades, technically comparable to final Neolithic material from Pithala from Kera, come from two or three areas of the interior of the island at a relatively high elevation. Most chip stone relates to the Bronze Age, mainly later than the level of Bronze Age 1 on the basis of the pressure blade dominated assemblages. A number of locations along the north coast produced evidence of production, confirming that local populations were not reliant on obsidian workers based at Bascalion. The latest diagnostic finds are two obsidian hollow base points, a distinctive type associated with the middle Aladdin southern Greek mainland, but rare in such a context. These may represent a new form of prestige group of practice imported from the mainland, perhaps alongside Grenadine in pottery. The earliest pottery corresponds to the god of Pelos culture of the Cyclades, which potentially stretches to the end of the late Neolithic, final Neolithic elsewhere. Pre Gascalio activity is tentatively suggested, with substantial evidence for occupation between late early Cycladic 1 and early Cycladic 3. Special finds include fragments of early iron, early Bronze Age marble figurines of both the schematic and folded arm types, and of marble bowls. A systematic search was made for rooted early Cycladic cemeteries. Clusters of potential graves were located in the area between Ponakia and the Hill of Gerani. Three petroglyphs were identified at Ponakia and Dumarku, <coughs> all with identified cavities arranging spirals, fitting the known repertoire seen in the petroglyphs now in the Museum of Apirmovos on Naxos. <coughs> Evidence of post Gascalio Bronze Age occupation includes a significant number of tripod legs from Minerva style cooking vessels, grey linen, potentially from the very end of the Middle Atlantic, and a bridge spout from a jungle jar. 
Although how long the period of activity is represented is unclear. Thereafter, ceramic evidence shows chaos moving in and out of the stream. Late Bronze Age shirts are so few as to suggest that chaos was then largely uninhabited. Early Iron Age to early Roman pottery is also rare. The archaic period is represented by a few 7th and more 6th century shirts, but 5th and 4th century pottery is more plentiful, as one might expect given the appearance of the island in the Athenian tribute lists. Attic imports, plus a few Cycladic imitations, are mostly shapes suitable for the domestic table or funeral use. Flame table vessels, a 5th century red figure bell crater, and lamps. Classical building complexes were mapped at Hale Avenue in the Royal Castle. The soil Hellenistic piece, an intact 2nd century DM lamp, confirms some activity during this phase. Middle Roman to Early Bronze Age, Early Byzantine pottery, mainly amphorae, red slipwares, and lamps, reveals exchange with Asia Minor, other Aegean islands, Cyprus, and North Africa, mostly during the 6th and 7th centuries with a few 5th century examples. Later Byzantine and post-Byzantine material, such as Mayolica, Chernakulewa, Ottoman pipes, Pithoi, and various amphorae, is concentrated around Grammatia, with sparse scatters in the west and southeast. 2013 campaign marked 50 years of research on chaos, an anniversary celebrated here in the Archaeopedia Thuria in October last. By contrast, the project with which I conclude our figure work presentation is new to the school, an intensive pickup survey in the ancient limestone forest at Cambria. Over a decade of research in the Corinthia by project director Chris Hayward has revealed numerous quarries, many in the heart of residential areas, representing at least 4.5 million cubic meters of stone extracted over 1500 years. The two complexes at Cambria were selected for a combined archaeological and geoarchaeological study. For the first time in Greece, this will permit a holistic understanding of the chronology a material culture of stone extraction, the subsequent use of the space, and its integration into local, unusual, historical, and cultural contexts. The Kenkro quarries are mostly small, shallow pits, some representing extraction over short periods, perhaps for single projects. Relatively undisturbed by modern activity, they preserve the deposition and formation processes operative in each area, enabling discrimination between material in the primary or close to primary context linked to a period of quarrying, that redeposited during quarry operation in the immediate area, and that redeposited after quarrying has ceased. Intensive coverage of the quarry pits and immediate surroundings, with walkers two metres apart collecting all visible artifacts and mapping isolated clusters and individual items, identified a common association between ceramic deposits and quarry edges or quarry debris, within which we note multiple drawings between differentially worded shirts within scatters irrespective of date, thickness, or firing. Different structures of assemblage, tile plus storage vessel plus cups, or single thin wall cups of the quarry edges, were likely associated with specific activities, enabling a spatial model of ceramic use to be developed. Finally, in order to identify activity in the near vicinity of the quarry pits, 100 metres only was sampled around them. Activity in both complexes dates from the 5th century BC to the 5th century AD, declining thereafter through the 6th and 7th centuries. The classical date accords with Cambria's appearance as a stone source in the Epidorian building accounts. Six inscriptions, apparently made by contractors or masons in a series of small linked quarry pits at the west end of complex B, are the first related to quarrying activity found in the Corinthian. The onomastics suggest a probable date around the 1st to 2nd centuries AD. This, the longest text, was carved with a pointed pick, the same tool used in quarry related stone cuttings on adjacent surfaces, suggesting that Mufas was a contractor and a stonemason who marked the completion of the contract. Others record the names of contractors or stone workers responsible for areas of quarry, and different hands suggest that individuals, rather than any authority, carved them. This area produced one of the largest ceramic collections in the complex, with the largest shape range, fine tableware, footwear, tile, pithos, and amphora, beginning in the late 5th century BC, and with peaks in the classical to late Hellenistic and middle to late Roman. The main forms are Roman thin wall drinking cups, approximately contemporary with the inscriptions, which occur especially in the northern part, variously associated with other fine wares and water storage vessels. 
Towers and pithoid clusters, mostly free of drinking cups, may indicate the location of structures, perhaps sheds or shelters, near the foreign edges. In complex A, a discrete settlement was contained within a large plowed field, perhaps a series of buried chronicles. The earliest identifiable pottery is archaic, but archaic Hellenistic shirts are rare. More common early Roman finds include cooking and takeaways, and Brindisian and Northern Aegean, possibly classic Nazareth. Most finds are later on, second to fourth century lamps of Brunier types 27 and 28, fifth to sixth century cooking pots and late Roman tilantro, and tableware featuring African red slip and late Roman sea imports and imitations, strongly suggestive of sixth century activity. Significant numbers of lithics were found in all parts of complex A. These are mostly cores and flakes with some retouched tools. Most are churt, with a small number of obsidian or pitchstone. The entire production process is represented in two concentrations. The sources and dates of these tools will be the subjects of further study. Ancient Rome suggests that stone from the Cambria quarries was also transported to Ismia and other Corinthian locations. Two sections of wheel rut were observed in the northern part of Complex A, one indicating a relatively heavy vehicle and perhaps the carting of stone blocks, and the other a nearby series of shallow ruts suggesting the relocation of narrower gauge wheels to obtain the best purchase. Post quarrying occupancy was traced in several locations. In the central part of Complex A, a series of collapsed structures within and immediately outside the adjacent quarry produced a range of late Roman to early modern roof tiles. The remains of a pebble and water floor were found in the northern part of Complex A, within the quarry, and possibly inside a domestic space. A further example, which could also be contemporary with the period of quarrying, is a door threshold cut through the thin wall of bedrock remaining after the extraction of stone blocks from adjacent areas. But from the archaeology of ancient industry, it's a small step to the Fitch Laboratory, where projects range from Iron Age Macedonia to Neolithic Nubia, and from Roman Cephalonia to Minoan Crete. In September last, Dalitika Nadeka completed her tenure of the Williams Fellowship in Ceramic Petrology. Her research is focused on the Neolithic Thessaly and the prehistory and history of the central Ionian islands. Her diachronic study of the production and consumption of coarse and pitching ware in Kefalonia and Ithaca showed that throughout prehistory, pottery production on both islands relied heavily on local resources. Thereafter, as fabric recipes crystallized, production became more standardized, and imports steadily increased. One or two prehistoric recipes survived. But in the main, new recipes emerged to crystallise from Hellenistic times onwards. Regional recipes tested on both islands and the mainland around the Quattolis were used for, for specific types of cooking pot during the classical to Hellenistic, Roman, and late Roman periods. Kefalonia and Ithaki, on intersecting maritime trade routes, became part of the networks developing in the Western world. In pre Roman times, both islands participated in the wide trade networks of Corinth and Aegean. From Hellenistic and notably early Roman times onwards, trade in courseways intensively. Cooking pots were produced in numerous workshops and circulated widely in the Mediterranean. Ithaki and Kefalonia favoured imports from Asia Minor, notably Ephesus and Fulcana, and to a lesser extent, extent to central Italy. Dr. Pindadeka's synthesis of old and new analytical data on pottery exchange in Neolithic Thessaly and central Greece revealed a rich ceramic landscape within Thessaly while Central Greece followed a different trajectory, combining selective stylistic adoption with local technological practices. General stylistic similarity in the Neolithic repertoire throughout Thessaly is seen as a unifying factor. Wide regional networks, as in the case of late Neolithic grey, black burnished, and black on red weathers, connect northern areas to the south of Thessaly. But all other networks, middle or late Neolithic, seem rather localised, usually involving a few neighbouring sites. The most interesting of these is attested in the polychrome and polychrome layers of southern Thessaly. Decorations applied to the buff surface of the pot, whether or not it bears calcareous slip, in black, manganese rich, and red ferruginous paint. These wares involve elaborate technology and decorative styles in a tradition of tempered clay pastes with rock fragments, which derives from the main fabric identified as local to each site. And like other schemes of productivity so far identified in Neolithic Thessaly, this illustrates a shared tradition of grog tempering confined to the southern part of the region. 
indicating close contacts between people, including potters, and the sharing of ideas, rather than the circulation of pots. The new rooms, however, John Gade, is an Egyptologist whose doctoral thesis examines systems of pottery production and use within the late Neolithic and early Bronze Age cultures of Lower Nubia. It focused on the way in which material culture reflected underlying patterns of social organisation and economic activities, but also addressed the nature of cultural and historical transitions within Lower Nubia during the 4th and 3rd millennia BC. As a PhD student, he gained his initial training in ceramic pathology on the first Fitch postgraduate course. As Williams Fellow, his research will span a range of archaeological contexts in the Mediterranean and North Africa, including East Crete, Central Anatolia, Upper Egypt, and Lower Nubia. In 2012-13, he held a Fitch bursary for a pilot study of early and middle Nubian pottery from the late Neolithic A group from about 4,000 to 2,500 BC, and the early Bronze Age Sheep group, 2,500 to 1,500 BC, using samples from the cemeteries of Koshdanya into the south, Pharos, to the lower Nubia. The use of rock temper was identified for the first time in early Nubian pottery, material of the Koshdanya. A distinct textual variation between fabrics from the two sites may indicate significant regional variation, either in the natural or materials used, or in the preparation of clay pastes. These initial results have significant implications, not only for the potential determination of the problems of early and middle Nubian pottery, either by composition or technology, but also for the identification of localised long-term continuity in raw material procurement and raw processing. They pave the way for future investigations of intra-regional contact and exchange, as well as helping to address the question of cultural and historical continuity during the third millennium BC. For the study of a larger sample set, more wider range of sites will be needed to confirm these initial findings, but this work has already demonstrated the utility of some petrographic analysis in this region. Among established fitch programs, Hellenization of Macedonia is a cross-disciplinary investigation of the role of central Macedonia in Aegean networks during the late Bronze and early Iron Age, focusing on issues of migration, identity, <coughs> technology transfer, and the reproduction of craft traditions and consumption practices in the context of inter-regional contact and colonization. It is currently focused on two major sites, Tumba Thessalonikis and Methoni, with a growing range of comparanda from across the region. At Methoni, analysis of the inscribed pottery from the Aponio deposit is ongoing. Last year, I reported on the imported transport amphibia. This year, we investigated the production and circulation of pottery in the broader area of the Thermaic Belt. The emerging picture is one of coexisting craft traditions and intense mobility at various scales on the local and regional level. Individuals or groups from the area were closely engaged in wider networks across which people, products, and raw materials circulated. Hence, the early production of transport amphibia at a number of locations in the Thermaic Gulf their wide distribution across the northern Aegean, and the relatively high frequency of inscriptions and graffiti associated with merchants' activities compared with the wider Aegean. At Tumba, investigation of the pottery used by different households during the transitional phases, from the end of the Late Bronze Age to the beginning of the Early Iron Age, shows that different households use pots of different manufacture and origin for the same functions, reflecting potential differences in the social identities of their members and their connections with intra-site and inter-regional networks. I'll report next year on three new Fitch initiatives, a diachronic study of pottery production at Eretria in collaboration with the Swiss School, a study of later the Hellenic II pottery from rescue excavation at Latufi in northwestern Laotia, an investigation of the provenance of the late Bronze Age repertoire of fine drinking vessels in the sanctuary of Zeus on Mount Bikea in Arcadia, coupled with investigation of the fine Neolithic to early Bronze Age pottery found beneath the altar. Equally, I can only touch upon the work of our many laboratory fellows and associates, such as the Fitch Senior Visiting Fellow, Michael Hood, who worked on formal remains from an early Iron Age votive deposit at Blackberry near Karistos in southern Elia, linked to the ritualised consumption of food and drink. This deposit contained both unburned bones from sacrificial wheels and burned bone from sacrifice. Femur and tailbone fragments were overrepresented amongst the burnt bone, fitting expectations of sacrifice based on later literary and ethnographic sources. 
The general lack of formages suggests that hides were first listed as square. And equally, I can note only briefly the work of the school's Lavendus Fellow, Chrysanthica Balakum, who completed a further field season on the classical shipwreck at Mazatos off the southeast coast of Cyprus, collecting data for her study of post deposition site formation processes, monitoring sea bottom currents, and taking calls for sedimentological analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a very rapid and highly selective review of a full year. More details of individual projects, our fellows and teaching activities, including the postgraduate courses and professional development for school teachers, can be found in our annual report and AG online, both published on our website. In closing, I take the opportunity to introduce three new members of our staff, Nguyen Mula, the Scientific Research Officer in the Fitch Laboratory, following the departure of Vittorio Rebekulu to a lectureship at UCL Doha, IT Officer Jean Sebastien Lou, replacing George Brusecker, who is now with the Qatar Museum's Authority, and Abigail Baker, who manages the curatorial project at Kunasos. I also express the gratitude of the school to the Secretary of the Archaeological Society, Dr. Petrarchus, for his continuing hospitality, and not only on this occasion. And to the Secretary General of the Ministry of Culture and Sports, Dr. Lina Goni, the Director General of Antiquities, Dr. Maria Andrea Gatti Bazaki, <laughs> and the many colleagues in the Ministry who have made our 2013 fieldwork program possible. We particularly thank those then in charge of the regions in which our major projects took place Dr. Stella Kosumaki in Piraeus, Mrs. Ekaterina Delaporta and Dr. Paniotis Hadidakis in the Cyclades, Dr. Paraskevi Karamaral in Kharkis, Mrs. Yuan Sebezadaki in Heraklion, Dr. Konstantinos Kisos in Corinth, Dr. Alkistis Papadimitriou in Nathalie in Sparta, Dr. Maria Fotinikov Konstantino in Lamia, Dr. Angeliki Simusi of the Ethereum of the Maritime Antiquities, Dr. Chrysa Sofia Nu in Nice Nicolos, and Mr. Andreas Sotili in Apostoli.